Well, the Michigan State University chapter of the Society of Women Engineers is celebrating 50 years of advancing women in the field of engineering, and we're going to talk about that today. It gives us a chance to talk about women in engineering and how that is evolving, and we're going to do that with three Spartans, and we're going to do that with Laura Gannick, who is the Applied Engineering Sciences Director and an alum of the program. Welcome. Thank you. We have Diana Villagran. Is that, did I pronounce your last name correctly? Yes. Diana Villagran is a class of 21 alumna in mechanical engineering as well. And you might have seen Diana on TV. <laughs> She's in those cool GM ads you've been seeing. And Sarah Perdue is also a mechanical engineering senior. She's actively involved in women in engineering. And welcome to you all. So, and let me start with you, Laura. I kind of said who you are, but a little bit more your background and and what you do here at MSU. Okay. Um, I came to MSU in 1987 as a freshman engineering major and went into mechanical engineering, did some internships and co-ops, decided to get my master's, which rolled into a PhD, and suddenly I was faculty. I got my first faculty position in the state of Oregon, and we were out there about 10 years, had a couple kids, and decided family was more important, so we came back to Michigan. I was at Wayne State for a few years, and then had an opportunity to come back to my alma mater, and I started in the mechanical engineering department, and in 2012, I went into applied engineering sciences to help facilitate teaching, and became the director of the program in 2015. And why, as a student, did you choose MSU, and how do you think it prepared you? I thought it prepared me really well. When I was looking at universities, my entire family had gone to Wayne State, including one of my older brothers, and he went there because he had a full ride. And I applied to college and got no scholarship offers. And my father said, well, we have to pay for it so you can go wherever you want. (laughs) So I ended up at Michigan State. It was far enough away from home to feel like I was gone, but not so far that I couldn't come home. So it was about an hour I grew up in the Metro Detroit area. And Diana, what do you do for General Motors? I am the mechanical engineer for the body shop. And so what are some of your duties then? I specialize in conveyors, so I work on the central under the central engineering team um, with the conveyor group. Cool. And give us a little bit of your interesting background from the migrant farming community or a first-generation student, a little bit of your background and how you came to be at MSU in engineering. Yep. So I grew up um, working in the fields, and my parents traveled from Florida to Michigan every year. Um, you know, in the summers we worked and then after school you worked. (laughs) So basically any opportunity that you had to help the family, um, you worked. We did anything from like picking tomatoes, eggplant, squash, any legume, basically. Um, and then they would come up north for the apple season. So we would live in camps that the farmers would provide. And then when the season was over, we would head back to Florida. Um, so we we started school here in Michigan, and then when we transferred, we would transfer all of our classes over to yeah. Florida. And then, so why MSU? How did you get to MSU? Why did you pick MSU? So, actually, my brother started here at MSU, um, I would say about three years before me. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it. So, um, I just made it my task to finish something that, although he couldn't accomplish, um, due to the circumstances he was in, um, basically make it our goal to make it there. And is it the CAP program? Is what the, We yep. have a program that works with migrant. Were you recruited, or is that how you yep. got in so touch? I um, <clears throat> Yeah, so we both went into the CAMP program, which is... A, CAMP, sorry. Yep. It's like a college assistant migrant program um, for students who have any background in the agricultural setting, Um so that's how he came in. I actually applied to the school, and then because they knew he was my sibling, they ended up pulling the application so that I could also join the program as well. So I ended up joining the program, which is like a, it's basically to build the community and provide that assistance that you don't always have at home, Yeah. Um, depending on the circumstances right. that you grew up in. Now, Sarah, so a little bit of your background, why MSU for you? Yeah, so I grew up in southwest Indiana. It's about seven hours. Uh, around seven hours south of here. Um, And I grew up with um, dad in engineering. My mom was a teacher, but um, 
kind of the typical story. I always enjoyed science and math, but decided I wanted to go into engineering. And so started looking for schools. And I initially was looking around at schools for athletic reasons, but um, ended up not panning out. So I had applied to Michigan State and they had offered me really, really good academic scholarship. And I was invited to come to campus through the ADS program, which is like a scholarship competition for out-of-state students. And so that got me to visit campus. And then through the Honors College, I was offered a two-year research position. And so I thought that that was a really special opportunity that not many universities kind of offer research to young people, especially coming into the program. And so combined with a lot of money offered to come to school, along with the work opportunities and being far enough away from home, but close enough that I could still drive it ended up being a perfect opportunity for me. So that was how I ended up here. So let's talk a little bit about the Society of Women Engineers celebrating 50 years at, at, as the MSU chapter. A little bit, Laura, probably you first, sort of the history, you know, why was it formed and kind of the mission, how that mission's evolving in these 50 years? I think the Society of Women Engineers has done a lot to advance the community of women in engineering. When I was an undergraduate student, I chose not to be involved with SWE, and I did that because I felt I needed to be able to work with men, and that had to start in college. And so I went through, I formed my study groups from the students in my classes. There were a number of classes I took that, you know, let's say there was 50 kids in the class and I might have been the only woman. And people would find me in the computer lab and ask me questions about class. And I'm like, well, I'm not sure we're in the right section. And she's like, oh, no, you're in our, my section. It's like, okay, so you recognize me and I don't know you. But I felt that I needed to be able to work with, with everyone. And then once I graduated and was a working professional, I realized how important SWE was. And building the relationships with other members that worked in a technical field, were having careers, but were had other challenges that were similar to mine. And I, in my ignorance at 18, didn't think that I needed that support system. But as I matured, I realized, oh yeah, men and women were different. And we have different challenges as we move forward in our careers. So I think SWE's been very supportive in that manner. It brings a lot of diversity together from different technical backgrounds because it's open to all engineering majors. And I think that's a good support system as well. And how would you say, Diana, the the field of engineering has evolved for women over this time? I know you haven't been there for the whole time, but how have you seen it evolve and get better? What would you still like to see happen? It's improving. You know, it needs improvement, but it's definitely getting there. I think that representation is, is a huge thing. And if you see somebody like you or somebody that has a similar background, it's it sparks that interest or it can spark that possibility that you can also get there. Um, I personally haven't had much interaction with women in engineering, just the nature of my job, but I think that it's definitely something that you feel more, and this is probably just personal, but I feel comfortable going up to a female and asking her some of the questions that I wouldn't ask a male just because it's it's human nature right yeah. um so i would i would say to that effect i would say that it's improving and we can continue to improve on it yeah and Ciro, how are you finding the field and the program at msu as you prepare to go out into the world um yeah i think that you kind of come into an engineering program expecting to be surrounded by men that's kind of how society puts it out to the world and that's so that's the expectation you grow up with um so coming in I wasn't necessarily surprised I mean mechanical definitely has a small um female percentage in the program um and out in the workforce so not necessarily surprising and you know just as it used to be you still walk into a class of 50 people and there might be more than one but there might only be five and so um it's definitely getting better like everyone has said but we're not quite there I think that it's encouraging to see so many people bringing it into the light and showing the importance of having that community. So being involved with women in engineering at school, um, having that community of women around you, seeing familiar faces in classes. Um, like Diana said, I'm more comfortable going up to a woman than I am a man to ask a question. And that's just nature and that's how it goes. But 
at the end of the day, having that comfort in classes, it helps you grow. But at the same time, um, there's a lot of expectations, I think, placed on people. So there is a lot of a lot of improvement to be done. But looking back, you can see where it started and it's definitely not there. But and I'll ask you all, but I'll stay with you for now, Sarah. What what would be your advice for some of the young women listening now, maybe about thinking of STEM fields or if they already know what are some things you've learned that they should think about as they prepare to choose a college I think that one of the main things that has always kind of stuck in the back of my head is that everyone has these expectations for you being a woman in engineering um if someone asks me what I major in and I say oh mechanical engineering they say wow that's really impressive that's awesome of you and although it comes from a good place just the pure shock um, that you would be doing that. They don't expect it. So I think being prepared to have that reaction, but being proud of what you do is really important because I am proud to be in engineering and I'm passionate about it and this is what I want to do with my life. So staying the course and understanding that there may be people around you and even people in your classes that are surprised when you do well, even if you don't know them. So all these expectations that people have for you, understand that they may be there, but understand that they're not coming from a place of knowledge. They're coming from a place of societal expectations. Mm. So being able to set those aside and do what you do and put the time and effort in and find the community in your classes and find other women around you that can hold you up and support you is really important. And you'll find the success if you want it. There might be a little bit of barrier there, but everyone can do it. Yeah. So. And Diana, what would, advice would you offer for those coming up behind you who may be at General Motors someday? I would say the biggest thing is not to be afraid. Um, I think that's something that my parents always instilled in me. I grew up, I have six brothers and two sisters, and we were never tasked with like, oh, you're a female, you're going to do this, and oh, you're a male, and you can only do this. Even though our culture, I'm Mexican, and the expectation for the culture is like a woman stays home and cleans and cooks like that's still the thing the generation that i live in right now is it's still expected of you to grow up get married and have kids and be a wife but thankfully my parents were very open and forward thinking yep so they definitely encouraged education um throughout my life and i think that knowing that it doesn't matter whether you're a female or a male I think if you want to do something, there shouldn't be anything holding you back. And I think fear a lot of times pushes that in people's heads. Like, what are people going to think of me or whether I fit into what they want me to fit in? I think that not letting people stop you is one of the biggest things that I would encourage. Um, Because at the end of the at the end of the day, it's your life. You're the one that's going to go through it and you're the one that's going to struggle Whether there's people there or not, you're the one that's going to have to go through it. And you're the one that's going to be studying. (laughs) You're the one that's going to be probably crying. And, (laughs) you know, if you did something wrong, it's all on your shoulders. So knowing that it's your decision to take and your decision to make, I think that that's one of the biggest things that I would encourage people um, to not let others stop them. Your parents sound like great people. Laura, let me ask you the same question. Sort of advice, lessons Mm -hmm. learned. What would you suggest? young women coming into STEM or Mm -hmm. thinking about it? It has to start in the K through 12 realm where you're not discouraging women and girls from staying active in math and science. I think that still happens. I know I saw it with my own kids as they went through. So I have a 19 and a 21 year old now. And I know that when I was growing up, my mother had to push to make sure I was in competitive math classes. And I had to do the same for my daughter as well. Because my father had his bachelor's and master's in electrical engineering, and everyone thought I went into engineering because he was an engineer. And I was really influenced more by my mother because growing up and going through public schools in Detroit in the 1950s, you were just tracked away from math. You were tracked away from science. Those were not the degrees you were going to get. You didn't, if you were going to go to college, you didn't need that background. So coming into college as prepared as you can be to take the math and the physics and the chemistry is going to open up opportunities for you, whether it's in STEM or, I mean, engineering is included in STEM, but whether you're going into the pure sciences or into engineering, 
you need to come in as prepared as possible. And at 13, 14, my experience and what I saw with my own kids was women started to be deterred from speaking out in class, deterred from showing up as being the smartest person in the class. And I think you should just stand up and be proud of the fact that, you know, yes, I understand this. Yes, I can solve this problem. I can go to the board and, and answer that question. And you have to become comfortable with being uncomfortable in a situation. And when you look at engineering, sometimes you can feel like a square peg in a round hole. But the mechanical engineering solution to that is just get a bigger hammer. And the square peg's going to deform, but so is the round hole. But they're still going to come together and work. So, Diana, before we let it you go, give us a little insight. How did the TV commercial come about? And what a cool experience. You're, and you're in these GM ads where they're promoting their employees and the things they do in their the rest of their life. And talk about what you are doing. You're still helping the community. That's camp helps as well. Yep. So for the commercial, I actually got um, selected from the group. I don't know how exactly it all turned out. I just know that my team, somebody from my team selected me um, and encouraged me. So it was, it's the campaign itself is earn a living, make a life. Um, and it's, it, they did posters, billboards and everything for uh, several people in the plant. And then the next round was like selections for the national portion of it, which would be the commercial. And somebody from my team ended up selecting me to do that. They liked my story and they thought it was unique. And um, they just wanted to showcase what I've done in the community. And that's how that came and about. And what are you doing in the community? So I do a lot of, um, I, I like to speak on my story a lot just because I feel like it's, I feel like not necessarily that's my duty, but I feel like a need to do it. I feel like I need to share what I went through to show those people that are going through something similar that it's, it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter from where you start. As long as as you have a passion to do something and you're dedicated to doing it, it, you're more than capable of doing it. And there are, like Sarah said, there are going to be obstacles in your way all the time but it's how you handle them and what you do to take them out of your way that um really determines where you sit in this world yeah so uh last question now uh you're we've had 50 years of the society of women engineers let's say you're put in charge just what are some things in the next 50 years you think i don't know what my question is really but as you look forward what do you hope improves or challenges opportunities both for women in engineering? It's kind of a big question. Laura, why don't you start? <laughs> I think there needs to be still, unfortunately, a, revol- a revolution in thinking. And it has to be societal. Because I've experienced the same thing um, that Paige has. It, I- I'm sorry, you do what? I'm sorry, you have a PhD in what? And it's like, yeah, that's what I do. And I am you know, a mechanical engineer by training. And it shouldn't be that surprising that that's what we all do, okay? Um, And I'm not sure what the societal shift has to be that accepts the fact that women can do math, women can do science, women can combine them and do engineering. They can design, you know, the next space shuttle. They can move forward in, you know, the aerospace industry, in the automotive industry, in the pharmaceutical industry, and find solutions, and having a diverse input at the table is going to create better designs overall. And women represent 50% of the population. And we have, you know, 100% of the solutions. <laughs> <laughs> Diana, as you just look forward, what are you thinking about? What concerns you? Optimistic, you know? I would say a thing, and maybe this is just something that I've made my own, but trying to pull somebody with you. Like, And I'm not saying I made it through. You know, I got my degree and there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I don't consider myself successful. I think it's a work in progress. Some days I feel good. Some days I feel defeated. But I think that finding somebody that you can help, and that's another reason why I like to push forward and share my story and help other students. I feel like if you bring somebody with you, you've made a difference. Because it's not just you now. You have somebody beside you who you helped along the way as here, well. Here, here. 
And I'll bet you every time you talk, there's a young Diana out there, or this is mm -hmm. what you're hoping that you inspired or some parents or something. So, yeah, that's great work. Sarah, as you look forward, what are you thinking? I think similar to what's been said, um, there is still just this overall kind of thinking that women aren't going to be as successful in certain paths as men may be. And I think that at the end of the day, um, you just have to be so proud of where you're at. And kind of like I said earlier, it's there's always going to be these expectations around you, these pressures around you. So I think with all of these programs that we have to continue to promote women in engineering and to teach young girls that it's exciting to come into STEM and it's exciting to go into engineering um, and continuing to encourage that. And then once you're there, I think that continuing to kind of look around every once in a while and understand that there are other women around you we've come far enough you're not the only one it may feel like it sometimes but you're not the only one and thank goodness we've come to that point but I think that sometimes we can just get so bogged down and so I think at some point whenever you feel that way stand up be proud of where you've gotten to look around see all of the other successful women around you and understand that there is progress that has been made and then continue pushing for that you know don't look around and say oh there's five people in this class that are girls and it's not one anymore and be okay with that continue to try and be involved in programs that work with outreach bring young girls into the program be proud of where you are and try and inspire someone else to do it and we do that by being involved in the community. You do that by continuing to support the women around you. You know, there's a lot of ways to do that, but making sure that you understand where you're at, how you got there, look around, be proud of yourself, be proud of the other women around you, but then be part of the change. Don't just let it be stagnant anymore. You're here, Spartans. Will, what a great way to close. Well, Sarah, Laura, Diana, thank you so much for talking with me today about women in engineering. Okay. Thanks, Russ. Thank you. And for much more on Michigan State University's chapter of the Society of Women Engineers, egr.msu.edu slash swe. And I'm Russ White. This is MSU Today.